Okay, we're going to get started. I know that we're going to have a few people coming in late. Uh, there's been a change in our lineup tonight. We thought that we were going to have Andreas Mitisek from the opera, and uh, he wrote an email saying that um, he has to have a rehearsal tonight because they have a new opera that's opening and they aren't ready. If you've never been to the Long Beach Opera, even though he deserted us tonight, I recommend <laughs> that you go hear them. It's quite a remarkable organization, and they perform in all kinds of strange places. Many of you know they perform here at the aquarium. They performed in parking garages, and uh, their next performance, the, the subject is Van Gogh, the artist, and uh, it's somewhere, I don't know what kind of a facility it's in, but it, it, it is worth going to, to hear the, the Long Beach Opera. They tell stories, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Lisa Crone, who has written this wonderful book, Wired for Story, has been here several times. She has taught courses for our education department. She was the keynote speaker in the Science on a Sphere conference that we had here. And uh, stories are the way throughout the history of humanity that we have passed down traditions, we've passed along skill sets, and, and uh, story is no less important now than it was before we had all of these mass media. Story is important in the arts, the social sciences, and even in the physical sciences. Whether we know it or not, the best scientific papers tell stories, because stories give stickiness to ideas and they help people remember, and they provide all kinds of hooks when you want to recall something. I can remember, as a graduate student in psychology, uh, someone I mentioned last week, Jerome Bruner, said, the problem with the human mind is not one of storage. It's one of retrieval. And the best way to be able to retrieve important ideas, themes, is through stories that provide different hooks that we can connect things to. So Lisa's going to tell us about the power of the story. And after she's finished, there will be some time for discussion. And uh, after that, Victor is going to talk to us about sculpture and how the arts can be used to convey important conservation messages. And then after that, I'm going to make some observations about science and art. So please welcome Lisa Crum. Elizabeth, she is a marine biologist. 
biology. She's currently the conservation program manager at Microfusion Conservation Trust, and that is pretty good, I think. A story changed her entire life. Sometimes stories change the course of a nation. For instance, do you know what's often cited as one of the major reasons for the success of the civil rights movement in the 1960s? And I know a lot of things come to mind. But how about this? A novel, it was called, To Kill a Mockingbird, and it changed how white America viewed racism by allowing us to see it through the eyes of the Scout, a six-year-old white girl. Oprah Winfrey called it our national novel, and First Lady Laura Bush said, it changed how people think. Story is the most powerful communication tool on the planet because story takes dry facts, big concepts, abstract ideas, and translates them into something very specific that we can experience and so feel. And as we'll discuss tonight, that is the basis upon which we make every decision we ever make and upon which our worldview is built. Story is built into the architecture of the brain. We are literally wired for story. And that's why, as storytellers, it's really important to understand story, what it is, where it came from, and what gives it the power that it's got. So I'd like to talk to you about four things tonight. First, how story and the brain evolved in tandem. Then, well, why is it story and not fact we use to make sense of the world? Then, well, what is it that gives story its unparalleled power? And finally, we'll come back and we'll actually talk about a story and how story affects us every day in our lives by looking at an actual, I mean, I know originally built as performing arts, and I'm going to talk about something very low realm movie. Um, low brown movie, in fact, and then we'll talk about what we really need to know in terms of how stories affect us every day. So we'll begin with how story and the brain evolve in tandem. And you'll hear me say a couple of times tonight, this is going to change how you really think about something. This is the first time, and this is going to change how you think about story, or very well might. But one thing I think we can all agree on right now is that we all love stories, right? We love stories years old, your mom read them to you, you love getting lost in a good story. And in fact, there's never been a society on Earth that didn't have storytelling. Story is a human universal. But because we like it so much, because it feels so good and it's so enjoyable, it's very easy to mistake story for entertainment, right? Because what do you do? Uh, when you get home from work every day, right? You've done real work in the real world that has a real consequence with the real people. And what's the first thing you do? You know, besides get a snack. The first thing you do is you turn on the TV, you pick up a novel, you start watching a movie because you want to lose yourself in a world of make-believe, right? You've done something that mattered, and now this is your way of rewarding yourself and kind of kicking back and vegging out and chilling out and really just having a good enjoyable time. And the problem is, because we enjoy stories so much in that way, we tend to marginalize it, because we think of it as entertainment for entertainment's sake, as if it didn't serve a real purpose, as if it was optional. It's very easy to think, you know, I know that our lives are drabber without stories, but we have survived just fine. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Story was crucial for our evolution. We got here because of story. Think of story as the world's first virtual reality. Story is what allowed us to envision the future and so plan for the thing that from then to now still scares us more than anything in the world. Do you know what that is? Do you know what scares us more than anything? The unknown, the unexpected. And think about it in your own. How often is what you expect to have happen what actually happens, right? Except for the bad things. No, it does happen. But usually, it doesn't. And when what you expect to have happen does, how often does it feel like what you thought it was? Hardly ever. Stories are simulations that allow us to go through difficult situations, <laughs> that I 
good faith to see what would that really feel like? What would I have to do? What would I have to learn in order to survive that situation? Like, I see those red berries over there, and they look really, really delicious, and I am starving. And did I mention it's the Stone Age, so I can't like go to the market, you know, buy something, get home and nuke it? <laughs> but I heard this story about the caveman next door. You know, the guy who eat anything? And they said he gobbled down a couple handfuls of those berries. And the way he was like writhing on the ground and foaming at the mouth before he died, I mean, he died, that should be enough, right? But it also sounded really, really painful. So I'm going to forego the berries for delicious and eat a couple of cold, stale bugs instead and live to see the dawn. In other words, the story was so crucial to our survival. It was so seminal. Nature, our biology, our brain, evolved to find story pleasurable, so we pay attention to it and not eat the red berries. Story feels good for the same reason food tastes good, because we need it in order to survive. Which means that that great feeling that you get when you're lost in a good story, and I know we've all felt that when time goes away and we're just completely in this other world, it's not arbitrary, it's not ephemeral, it's certainly not pleasure for pleasure's sake. You know what it is? It's biological. It's chemical. It is a hardwired survival mechanism. It's dopamine. It is your brain's way of rewarding you and encouraging you to follow your curiosity and find out how that story ends. What would it feel like? What do I need to know in order to go through that situation? Because your brain, you come to every story asking one question in what's known as your cognitive focus. And the vast majority of your brain is what's known as your cognitive subconscious. And it's the part of your brain that makes decisions for you without you having to think about it, right? I mean, it plows through the information that comes to you at warp speed and makes decisions. Because this is a slight aside. Do you know how many pieces of information come to your five senses every second? Very good. <laughs> 11 million. 11 million pieces of information in your five senses. If you had to make sense of them, you wouldn't be able to get out of bed at night in the morning, let alone get into it at night. So your cognitive subconscious rips through and lets you know what to do. The part of your brain that you think with is a teeny tiny part of your brain, and it's the part of your brain that's there to, as a deal breaker, right? When you don't know what to do, when something unexpected happens, and you've got to figure out what do I do now, that's when your conscious brain comes in and you're kind of thinking about it, it's very slow. If you had to count on that part of your brain to do anything to live, we would not be here having this conversation right now. So your cognitive subconscious is hardwired to come to every story asking one question. What am I going to learn here that's going to help me make a good enough? What am I going to learn from this story that's going to help me learn to not eat the red berries or, as important, to survive in the social world? in the social sense, because our brains are just as hardwired to need to belong, that needing to belong isn't something, oh, it's just so emotional, we don't really need to belong, we're you know, stalwart individuals on our own, not so. We're wired to need to, to, to belong and to be part of a group. So we turn the story and figure out, well, how do I get along with people? What makes people tick? What do I need to do to be my most authentic self? And the takeaway is, we don't turn to story to escape reality. We turn to story to navigate reality. Which brings us to our second. Because I can see you might be thinking, OK, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean you use story to navigate reality? You know what facts are for? I mean, I get the story dramatizes facts and it you know, makes them accessible and we can feel them. But, but is it the facts that we use to make sense of the world? I don't really understand. And the answer is no, it's not. It's story. Because what story does is it takes those abstract facts and translates them into something very specific that we can feel and that then causes us to take action. Let's talk about what happens when we get just facts? Let's see, well, what happens when you get just facts about something? Well, usually it's one of two things. The first thing that happens when we just get facts, and now this is where we're getting facts, and we can't see what the relevance of those facts are to us in our lives. We judge everything based on how it's going to affect us. We have a very hard time paying attention at all. You start telling someone something, and they have no idea of what your point is or how it relates to them, even if they try to listen. 
it is going to go right by. And I'm sure that we all remember that experience from school. <laughs> this is a business meeting, you know, where your teacher is going on and on and on about, say, the succession of German monarchs from Charles the Fat from, you know, 881 to 887. And no matter how hard you try to listen, it is just going over your head. You really want to pay attention, but because you have no context to put it in, it's gone. If this part of your brain can pay attention, it's there to pay attention to things that matter to you. So the teacher's going on and on. You're trying to listen, and what you're really thinking about is, I'm really hungry. I wonder how long it is to lunch. You know, that cute guy over there is looking at me. I wonder if he likes me. And things that matter. It kind of goes back to school. Remember when they told you there's something wrong with you? You didn't remember all that stuff? It was on them because they were giving you information that you had no way of processing. And I'm sure we all remember going home to, to your mom and going, I don't know why I have to learn this. I'm never going to use it in my life. So that's what happens when we get information that we can't do wise well with. The other thing that happens when we're given facts, and this is now when we're given facts, the kind of fact where it's going to, it's in, it's, it's, it's the opposite of what we already believe, right? It goes against our beliefs, or it's, they want us to expand our beliefs, or they want us to try something new. And when that happens, up comes your analytic brain. And its goal is to poke holes in everything that comes at you. Because we're also sort of hardwired not to want to change. Once you believe something, and, and this is part of you, it becomes part of your identity. It becomes part of how you see yourself. Even down to the truth painting. You know, that's me, that's mine. You're going to come and do something else. I don't think so. I'm going to argue. And I think we've all had that experience, right, where someone's telling you something that goes completely against your belief. Like, I mean, the last election we had was pretty polarized, right? I would bet everybody in this room, whoever they wanted, they wanted really badly, and the other guy they didn't like at all, right? And remember when someone would come up to you and start telling you why the other guy was better? And what did you do? You sat there, you smiled, and you nodded, and what were you really doing? You were waiting for them to stop talking, so you can tell them why everything they just told you was 100% wrong, and why what you believe is right. The problem is, when you're talking, you're doing the same thing to you. So you don't get the story, on the other hand, anesthetizes that analytic part of the brain. The dopamine comes up, and you go, once upon a time, or here's what happened to my grandma, or whatever it is, and you want to know what happens next. Up comes the dopamine, and it says to the analytic brain, shh, shut up, don't talk. Quiet. The story's going to happen here. This is going to feel good. I'm going to like this. Don't talk. I don't want to get lost in the story. And when I say get lost in the story, I'm not talking metaphorically. I mean that literally. When you're lost in a good story, the areas of your brain light up that would light up if you were doing what that character is doing. We really are there. It really is the world's first virtual reality. In fact, they say that stories can enlarge our ability to empathize. Because you know how it is, you might look at some other person, a group of people, and go, Look at those idiots, man. Look at what they're doing. If that was me, if that was me, I'd never do it that way. I would do it perfectly. They're fools for doing it the way they do. And then you read a story where you're in the skin of that person and you're going through that experience and you've got their same background and you go, Oh, this is way different than what I expected, right? Our expectations are big. It is totally different. And you're going, oh, this is much harder than I thought. In fact, we're more alike than I thought. And it changes how you see the world and perhaps even your behavior. Let me give you a great example of this. There was a study that was done at Ohio State in 2010, and it was in part to, to, to determine what would have a greater effect on college-age women's use of birth control, right? Would it be like a new style documentary about the horrors of teen pregnancy? Or would it be an episode of a television show? <laughs> so one group of women watched this documentary. It was really well done. It had high production values. And it had a lot of really scary facts and really scary figures and really scary statistics about how your life was going to be just totally destroyed if you had a baby when you were a teenager. You wouldn't make as much money. You wouldn't go to school. You'd die soon. You'd sick more. They had teen moms and dads talking about you know, how horrible and hard their life had become once they had children. The other group of women watched an episode of the nighttime teen soap opera, The O.C. And in that particular episode, uh, two of the main characters, uh, high school seniors, Ryan and Teresa, were actually dealing and going through the gut-wrenching consequences of an unintended pregnancy. Now, those women were in Teresa's skin feeling what she went through. 
Okay. No facts, no numbers, no statistics, just that one single moment. And I don't even know where this is going, right? The women who watched the documentary, their behavior did not change, right? Up came that analytic brain that went, that's those idiots. I would never do that. That doesn't scare me. I'm perfectly fine. It hasn't happened yet, right? So I'm perfectly safe to keep doing exactly what I'm doing. That could never be me. I would never do that. I weren't scared at all. Women who watched the TV show, they were in Teresa's skin. They were feeling what she was feeling. Again, just that one moment where you find out you're pregnant, you don't want to be, and your whole life turns upside down. When they felt that viscerally, the last thing they wanted to do was feel it, and by Terry said, was to feel it for real in their lives. And their behavior changed. Now think about it just for a minute, because what was the whole reason for the documentary in the first place? It was made for one reason and one reason only to change the behavior of the women who watched it. And guess what? It didn't. In fact, if anything, they've done studies that show when you try to convince someone of something, you just really get them to double down on what they already did. TV show, like what was its goal? Like to get high ratings? To sell soap? You know, whatever it is that nighttime soap opera sell? Uh, I guess. But it was what changed behavior. Why? Because it took a very big problem and brought it down to one very clear, specific, that translated, Teresa felt it, and it translated that specific to something that could be recognized by the system through which we make every decision we ever make in our lives. Which brings us to our third point, and the second time I'm gonna say, this might change how you see things. This is a game changer. Because do you know what that system is? Our emotions. Every decision we make, we make based on how we feel about it. We feel first, and we think second. Often, what we do is we feel, and then our, our reason comes in to rationalize why we believe what we believe to be in. And this kind of goes against what we've always, goes against what I was taught, right? What were you taught about when you wanted to make a decision? What did they tell you? Here's what they told me. They said, if you want to make a decision, right, and any kind of decision, but especially on a big one, here's what you do. You get all the facts, all the figures, all the data, you marshal all that together, because you want to look at it, dispassionately, right, in the cold light of objective reason. And when you do that, there's one thing you want to be very careful of. You want to keep emotion at bay. Because emotion is a very irascible scam that is going to try to sneak in there and cloud your judgment, right? And make you make a, an irrational decision. And that's a really nice model, isn't it? I mean, it feels safe, it feels secure, it's something you can count on. Right? It's, it's very neat, it's like math. It makes you feel like you're in control. There's one problem. It is not how we process information. <laughs> it's just 100% untrue. We, if you, we feel first, and it is the emotion that drives what we do. Now, it does not mean, for two things first. One, when I say emotion, I don't want you to mistake it for being emotional, because that's how emotion is made the majority of emotional. I'm going to be irrational, I'm going to be hysterical, I'm not going to, you know, I don't mean emotion. I mean emotion. And what emotion really is, is, is it comes from feelings. And what feelings are, they're not something, again, that's ephemeral. Feeling is literal. It is a physical, chemical sensation that you get when something happens, a literal, physical feeling that then is translated by your brilliant body and your brilliant brain into an emotion that tells you what you want to do and how you feel about it. You know, that doesn't mean that the first thing you feel is what you do. Like I might go home tonight and decide, you know, it's midnight and I'm looking at the chocolate cake in the refrigerator going, I, I want to eat that entire chocolate cake. I feel like eating that entire chocolate cake. Doesn't mean I'm going to do it, right? Because then that thinking brain comes up and goes, I thought you were on a diet. <laughs> really? You need a chocolate cake? And you can bake that for your kid's birthday tomorrow? I'm going to have to cake in you know, place. It's not going to go over well. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to realize if I eat the cake, I'm going to feel bad. And so I'm not going to eat the cake. It all comes down to feelings. Every decision you make has important feeling that lets you know, yes, this is the right thing, no, that's the wrong thing. It's all we've got. We've got our bodies to decide what works and what doesn't. The interesting thing is, if you couldn't feel emotion, you could make a rational decision. You could make any decision. Let me give you a great example. There's an amazing neuroscientist. He's out of USC. His name is Antonio Damasio, and he uh, he's written several books. His most recent is called Self Comes to Mind, 
creating the conscious brain. And he frequently writes about a patient he had, a man by the name of Elliot. And Elliot was one of those guys who was very successful. Right? He had a great career, he had a great family, great husband, wonderful kids. He was one of those guys you call it. Elliot was a pillar of the community. Unfortunately, Elliot also had a benign brain tumor. And it was successfully removed along with a bit of his prefrontal cortex. And after that, his life just began to fall apart. And he was in the process of losing his job and his family when he went to Demonstra and said, help me, you know, I'm not me anymore. I, I, I don't know what to do. Please, can you tell me what happened? What's gone wrong? How do I get back to being me again? So Demonstra said, sure, he ran a battery of tests. And what he discovered is that Elliot had lost the ability to feel emotions. Now keep in mind, he still tested the 97th percentile in intelligence. And he could enumerate every possible solution, every problem. He just couldn't pick one, right? Now imagine, he would go into his office every day, and he'd look around, imagine, says, you imagine you walk into your office, and you're looking around, and you're going, should I do that thing that my boss has been yelling at me to do for the past year? In fact, yesterday he said he'd fire me if I didn't do it today. Should I do that? Or should I alphabetize my file folders again today for the 16th time? I don't know, how do, how do I pick what to do? Should I flip a coin? At lunch, he would go from restaurant to restaurant looking at menus, but he never went in because he didn't know what he felt like eating. In other words, everything really was six of one, half a dozen of the other. It is our feeling that lets us know what to do, what to believe, and who we are. As Harvard psychology professor Daniel Gilbert said in his fabulous book, Stumbling on Happiness, indeed, Feelings don't just matter. Feelings are what mattering means. And the takeaway is, emotion isn't the monkey that changes the system. Emotion is the system. And that's what story does. Story takes those big facts and it translates it into something very specific. So we only feel specific things that affect us. So something specific that allows us to feel what it mean to us and that is how we change our behavior. If you want to get anybody to do anything, that is exactly how it works. So now that we've answered those first three questions, let's talk about story for a minute. Let's shift gears for a second and talk about big stories, right? As opposed to just stories one on one or stories in business, but actual big stories like, like movies. And we'll talk about what, what is a story. We'll get technical for one sec, and then we're going to come back and I'm going to, to as I said, I will use a very popular movie as an example of this. So hopefully we'll all be so what is a story exactly? What are we talking about on the scale of novels and movies and, and, and plays? A lot of people think a story is something that happens. Sure, things happen in a story that's not a story. A lot of people think a story is something that happens to someone. Things happen to people in stories, it's not a story. It's not even something dramatic that happens. I mean, what is a story? I'm going to say this will sound kind of complicated. Is this for a big concept? A story is how what happens affects someone in pursuit of a difficult goal and how they change the result. And let me break that down so it becomes clear. A story is how it happens, and that's the plot. Those are the events that take place within the story. They happen to someone, that's that main character, the person we've been talking about whose skin we're in. Those things happen to that person, that person is on a difficult quest, that's what we've been talking about, that simulation, the problem that has to be solved before the story ends, and how they change as a result. And that is what your story is actually about. And then it's a big, not an actual game changer. A lot of people think stories about the plot. It is not. The story is about how the plot affects the protagonist. In other words, story is internal rather than external. Because the plot, what is that? That's the surface. That's like the surface world. And we come to the story to learn something. And guess what? We already understand the surface world. You are sitting in the surface world right now, right? And you know how to get here, you know how to get home. You pretty much got that down. We get the surface. What do we want to know? We want to know what's beneath the surface, right? What really is going on? What really makes people tell? I often think of story as the difference between what we say aloud and what we're really thinking, right? And think about it. You know, like how often is what you're saying to someone and what you're thinking the same thing? And which one is more interesting? <laughs> and which one is more juicy? And which one, when someone's talking to you, what do you want to know? 
right? What are you thinking when someone's saying, saying something to you? It's like if someone comes up to you and they come up to you and say, you know, Matilda, I'll love you forever. What's the first thing you think after my name's not Matilda? <laughs> first thing you think is, really? Why? Is it because you think I'm pretty? Is it because I have a lot of money? Is it because you need a place to stay? Or can I really trust you? I really want to know. And that is what we turn the story for. What makes people tick? What are people really thinking? I often think of story as an emotional cost-benefit analysis of taking a particular course of action. What would that cost me? And so let's talk about story for one more second, then we're going to go into the movies. Because what is story? Very basically, it's usually one character who comes into the story before the plot, who really wants something, and but they've got something holding them back. They come into the story without already. The plot is constructed to force them to go out and do this thing they want and have to overcome this thing that's holding them back in order to get it. Because that's what most of us are like in our real lives, right? You've got something you really want, and it will be hard to do. And so when do you decide to do it? Tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow when I'm over. I'll do it when the time is right. And if you look on the calendar, you know what it says? A week from now. We <laughs> never do that. We only take action when we're forced to. And that's what the plot does. It's a great story. Um, someone once asked JFK what made him a war hero. And he said, I didn't have a choice. They sank my boat. So the plot is there to sink your character's boat. So let's, let's now go for a decidedly lowbrow example. I, I often teach from movies because more people have seen the same movies and have read the same books, and it's a more accessible form of story. And so the lowbrow movie I want to talk about right now is Die Hard, right? The original Die Hard from 1988, not the, you know, one that bombed a couple months ago, <laughs> but die. Okay, so what's die hard about, right? It's not hard to change people. We'll talk about it. What's die hard about, right? What's the plot of die hard? That's what it's about. The plot of die hard is Bruce Willis um, is a New York City cop. His wife's got a good job and moved to LA. Um, he stayed in New York. Now he's coming to visit her on Christmas, and she's in a big office building at their Christmas party. He gets there, and pseudo terrorists take it over the building, and now he's got to basically obliterate every terrorist that there is in order to save everybody at the party, or almost everybody, right? Um, his wife and himself. That's the plot. That the guy is about, would you care about that? I mean, you know Bruce Willis. I mean, yeah. But he lives or dies, and just watching him shoot people, why would you really care? Is that why we're invested in that movie? No. What's Die Hard really about? Die Hard is about whether or not Bruce Willis gets his wife back. That is what he comes into the story wanting. He wants his wife back. He's let her go. And now the plot is going to force him to come to grips with that. Well, what is it he's going to have to learn? Because this is what we're learning, right? We're coming to the story to learn something. So what are we going to learn? Well, well what's, what's his problem? What does he have to overcome? Well, how did he lose his wife? Here's how he lost his wife. She got this really good job, good promotion. Now, now keep in mind this is 80. This might be slightly different. But 1980, she gets this great job, and she goes, come on, honey. You know, I got this great job. We've moved to LA. It's really nice in LA. You know, we'll make more money. Let's go. And he's like, no. I know he's love, never about love. No, I mean, not go. OK, now, why didn't he go? There are two reasons. Again, one is more 1980s. His first reason, big 1988, maybe hopefully not so much now, is I'm not going to go because I'm the man. I'm the man, and we say where the man's job is. I don't understand what part of that you don't get. I mean, it's so clear. The other reason he didn't go is a deeper reason. And that was he defined himself by being a New York City cop. That is who he was. That was his complete identity. You cannot be a New York City cop in Los Angeles. It's not possible. And he was scared of that thing that we talked about from the beginning, of what? The unknown. I'm going to go there. I don't know who I am. I'm going to be someone else. I'm not going to go. So what did he do? He said, I'm staying here. You go. Right? You go. And what did he think was going to happen? How did he think his problem was going to solve it? He always think it's going to be really easy. He thought, she'll go to LA. She'll bomb out at her job. She'll get fired. She'll hate her. She'll miss me so much. And she'll come back with her tail between her legs, and I'll be a really nice guy, and I won't say I don't. He thought everything would go back to normal. And in his story, nothing ever goes back to normal. Even in life, nothing ever goes back to normal. So what happens? He goes, and had those terrorists not been taking over Nakatomo Plaza, you know, and he would have just talked to her, they probably never would have gotten back together. They would have fought, and that was it. But something really big happened and forced him to 
to come to grips with all of these feelings, right? Because that is the goal of the plot, to force the character to come to grips with these feelings. And that's why we're rooting for him. We want him to realize, oh my god, I, I really do love her, and I, and I don't want her. And, and as he goes through all of that daring do, that is what happens. And we do watch him change. And it gets to that part in the movie, you know, where it looks like all is lost, as we climb out here and you're going to every movie for you now. And here's, here's a movie book. When you're watching a movie, and if it gets to the last 20 minutes, and you think everything is gonna, like, it's gonna end as a tragedy, but the last 20 minutes, it suddenly looks like everything is really happy, it's gonna be a happy ending, you know it's gonna be a bad ending. If you get to a movie where 20 minutes from the end, it looks like everything is now totally destroyed, it's gonna have a happy ending. Yeah, I always end the opposite. Anyway, so getting back to Die Hard, what happens in that last 20 minutes? He, he talks to Al, he's talking to Al, right? He's gone through it, and we know he's learned his lesson. He's talking to Al, it's caught by it's like, also a very early romance, you know, the first time I can be romance. So he's talking to Al on his, on his walk. He's going, Al, I got a really bad feeling. I got a bad feeling. I'm not going to make it. And, you know, this is over. Find my wife. Don't ask me how. You'll know by then. And I want you to tell one thing. Say, honey, you heard me say I love you a thousand times. But you never got to hear me say, honey, I'm sorry. You know, Al's crying. We're crying. We know that he's actually, he's, you know, he's, he's done. He's gone to the other side. And of course, he does end up obliterating all of the bad guys, and he saves everybody at the end. They're all safe. And then Al saves him, but that's a whole other story. So when that's over, what did we learn? Right? What did we learn from Die Hard, you know, other than how to repel down a 50, you know, floor uh, elevator shaft? You know, just like, you know, don't do this in real life. Well, what did we learn emotionally? What did we learn about life that might change how we see things? Well, two things. One, we might have learned, I guess, say yay. You know, and if you're a guy watching, you're kind of macho, you might go, wow, Bruce Willis is pretty tough, John McClane, that cop. And he's really realized that, you know, maybe he's equal with his wife. Maybe, you know, with both of them, maybe I, I should look at my wife or my girlfriend, too. Maybe we are equal. I'm, I'm not going to try to be so tough. I don't have to be so tough, you know. And the women watching might go, thank God, there's a good one. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that it teaches us is, he realized that he didn't have to be a New York City cop to be who he was. He could be who he was wherever he went. You know, he took he took himself and probably all his guns too along with him. And you're watching, you're going, yeah, maybe we too. You know, maybe I can try that really hard thing to pull me out of my comfort zone. Boy, LA out of your comfort zone in New York. You know, it will pull me out. Maybe I will change too. And that is a pretty profound thing that a person might learn from a movie. That's what stories do. Stories change how people think. Stories change what people do. And that's why it is so important to understand stories, because we're all storytellers. And we're hearing stories all the time. And when a story grabs you, up comes that dopamine. Remember, it's a survival mechanism. You are helpless. You have no control other than to go under the spell of the story. Have you all heard that expression? You know, it's a willful suspension of disbelief. You know, what's my good story? It's a willful suspension of disbelief. Totally not true. There's nothing willful about it. You don't have a choice. We are just pulled in. It is biologically hardwired, just like our desire for sugar, fat, and salt, right? That was totally helpful back then, and now with the meat bees on every corner, it's not serving us so well. But we can't undo it. You can figure out a way to undo that desire for sugar, fat, and salt. Call me first. I want to think of it for a second. And you're going to make it a zillion dollars. So the point is, stories can really help us. Stories can change our entire lives for the better, like The Little Mermaid, and they can change the entire nation for the better, like To Kill a Mockingbird. But stories can also take us in the other direction. And the people who know this better than anyone are advertisers, televangelists, and politicians, right? Because you can end up at McDonald's at midnight, chowing down on a Big Mac, a super-sized fries, and a 32-ounce coat, because you deserve a break today. <laughs> so the takeaway is, if you're going to use story, and you are, because we're all storytellers, use it wisely. And when you're listening to stories, and you are every minute of every day, listen wisely. Yes, absolutely, you are going to feel first. Don't forget to wake up that little part of your brain up here. You think a second.
observation, sharp observation. And today I'm going to talk to you about a very um, important subject, the light of fish. First, I'm going to talk to you about this fish, and after I'm going to talk to you about the creation of the piece that I did. So, uh, Jerry, Jerry told you I am a sculptor. I sculpt a lot of sea life, wildlife, species in danger, and every piece that I sculpt is a story. So today I'm going to talk to you about a very important subject, a very catastrophic uh, issue that's happening right now as we speak. The invasion of the lionfish. Okay. The lionfish is, uh, is right now between Boston, you can find him between Boston all the way down to, uh, to uh, Costa Rica and it doesn't belong there at all. So there is about 10 different species of lionfish. The most common one, or the two invasive species, I would say, the two invasive lionfish are the red lionfish, and the other one is the is um, devil firefish. The one I'm going to focus on today is the red lionfish. So as you see, it's a beautiful red fish with a beautiful beige stripe. He has uh, some spike on his back, beautiful dorsal, beautiful um, pectoral fin. They are from Indo-Pacific. On the back of the, of the, of the, back of the fish, there is all this uh, venomous spike who are not uh, deadly for healthy humans, but very you know, painful. They grow all the way up to 15 inches. They can weigh all the way to 2.5 pounds. In the wild, they can live all the way up to 15 years. When they, when they are in Indo-Pacific, they have three or four predators. They have the comet fish, which is a very common uh, animal to prey on lionfish. They also have shark, grouper, and hill. This, um, there is different, uh, there is a lot of theory about how the lionfish end up in Florida. So the first one, they said that around the, uh, nine, uh, 1992, when Hurricane Andrew destroyed some uh, uh, aquarium, few lionfish were released and it became an invasion. But there is another theory, they did some DNA test and they find out that even before, in 1985, they find some lionfish in Florida. They think that it came maybe from some uh, collector, um, aquarium collector. They, they collect them and they find out that they eat everything in the aquarium, so they release them instead of killing them. But it's really hard for a collector to kill these own fish. So they, they release them. And right now you're gonna see a map, animate map from 1985 to 2013. So I want you to be very careful and look at the date when the lionfish really start being an invasion. So here it is. And that's what it is now. So it's pretty scary because this fish doesn't belong there. So you can find them from Boston all the way to Venezuela, Mexico, and they predict in the next 10 years it's going to be all the way to uh, the tip of Brazil. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge problem. I don't think people realize how bad this fish is. It's a beautiful fish to look at it, but it's really, really bad. So, so what is this pro what is a, why is it a problem? First, because they don't belong there, so they have no natural predator. All the grouper, the shark, the hill, who live in the water, Atlantic, Bahamas, and the uh, Caribbean, they don't recognize that the lionfish are the prey. So he has no natural predator. The female has a very high rate of reproduction. One female can lay up to two million eggs per year. They are voracious. They eat every fish. You put 
some lionfish around some reef, they will clean up the whole reef in three months. There will be no more fish besides lionfish. And when they're done cleaning up the fish, they eat each other. They're cannibal. So the, like I said, they prey on other fish. But the problem is they prey on smaller fish, and especially on baby. So not only they clean up the, the reef, but they also cut the cycle of reproduction. If you keep eating the baby, they cannot grow up and reproduce and make other baby. So it's, it's just gone, those fish are gone. They can consume 20 fish in 30 minutes. They open some lionfish and they find out six different species of fish in the same uh, uh, fish. So that's pretty scary. Their stomach can expand up to two thirds of their size. In some places, there are as many as 1,000 lionfish per acre of ocean. The range of water where they swim could be from two, two meters to all the way to 140 meters. So everything between those two depths is meal for them. And like I said earlier, they are expected to, to reach south of Brazil in the next five to 10 years. So it is a really, really bad problem. When they stink human, healthy human, think there you have, uh, you have some uh, nausea, vomiting, pain, but you, it's not deadly. So they are dangerous for divers and for fishermen. So that's why a lot of artists um, use the lionfish to, as an inspiration and also to uh, send a message. I think it's, it's a beautiful way to, to send a message showing the beauty of an animal. So my, this is a friend of mine, his name is Pascal Lecoq, he's in uh, Florida, and he created this beautiful painting about lionfish uh, called The Curse of the Lionfish. I'm a diver, I go all over the world, and I take my camera, I take pictures of animals, and I create pieces based on what I see on the world. This is a shot that I took uh, in the Bahamas. So when I took picture, I took different shots, to get the angle, the right angle, to be able to create the piece. So I was aware of, uh, of this problem the first time in Bahamas when I was diving with a friend of mine. And I, find, and, and I, and I saw her spear fishing lionfish. And I was, I was getting pretty upset about seeing her killing those beautiful animals. And she started explaining to me that the, the lionfish was eating and destroying the whole reef. So that's the only solution she was thinking the, the way she could stop this, uh, this invasion. So when I go home, and, uh, I decide I think I have to do something. As an artist, I have to do something. I have to create a beautiful fish to be able to send a message, not only by showing death, but showing beauty. So I start creating this uh, lionfish in wax. Uh, when I start creating a piece, there's two ways I can do it. I can create a piece in clay, or I can sculpt in wax. There is good and bad in both. I choose wax because this fish has a lot of detail. So it's easier for me to create detail in wax than clay. The, the, the bad, the, the not very, um, how would say, it's, it's harder for me to, uh, to sculpt in clay, especially on detailed pieces like this, because the fin and uh, the feather can bend pretty easily. In, in wax, it's easier. The only problem is I'm going to cast my master. Means if I cast the master, all the work I did for the, day, for the few weeks to create this piece is going to be gone. In clay, I'm going to be able to make a mold and I'm going to be able to pour three, four, five wax. So that's the problem of create, creating a piece in wax that you're casting the master. So I create uh, two different versions of the lionfish a small one and a big one. I'm going to tell you why later. But I create. Um, I create this piece, <coughs> and um, I bring a mold right here, so everybody's going to be able to see it. I make a mold from my, my wax master. The mold is made with silicone <coughs> plaster, and it allowed me to pour as many wax as I needed. If this edition is about uh, 27 pieces. The smaller fish is about three pieces. So even when I get the mold done, and I get my wax from
from the moon. I still have a lot of work to do. You can see it's missing the tail of the fish. Um, is missing one uh, dorsal fin. So I still have between a week, between a day and a week of work, even in wax. But when the piece is finished, that's when I bring the piece to the foundry. So the foundry um, starting a process called the shelling. The shelling, it's, it's, it's um, a bunch of different buckets filled up with some kind of porcelain cement. And you actually creating another mold from your wax. So you're dipping, uh, starting with a very fine grain of, uh, of plaster cement, and you let it dry for 24 hours, and you dip again, and you dip again on the, on the second bucket where the grain is a little bit harder, and you do this for a week. When, uh, when, everything, when everything is, when the shell is finished, actually the mold is finished, you let it dry. And you put this in an oven, at the same time, some liquid metal, bronze or stainless steel, is being uh, melt and the shell goes inside the oven, the wax is removed, and the metal is pulled inside. So it's a technique of the lost wax. When the piece is um, cool, is cool, you break the pieces and you get your duplicate in metal. So after this, after this, um, this, this process, that's the metal chasing. So you get your duplicate in metal and you start doing the chasing. The chasing is uh, uh, making these pieces as perfect as possible to be able to apply patina. So you have to do some welding, you have to put your name, your initial, your no no number of the edition, and it has to be completely cleaned up with no, no porosity inside um, to be ready to apply this, this chemical because uh, uh, the chemical will not react very well if there is any porosity. So that's when the patina stage arrives. Patina is chemical that you apply on the fish, on the metal, with a, a, a brush or a spray bottle. You're using a torch to heat up the pieces. And when it's at the right temperature, you apply patina on it. You apply those chemicals. They are um, pretty dangerous, so you wear a mask to apply the patina. And you get uh, this finishing that I was looking for. Tonight, I bring you three different, three different species. I, dif I bring you um, the, first, the, the first piece is the bronze without patina on it. So you can see what kind of metal finish I need before applying the patina on it. The second piece is another metal that I use a lot for my pieces. It's stainless steel. It's not chrome. It's, it's pure stainless steel. A lot of work to do to be able to get this kind of finishing. And the last one is the one on the picture right now. It's um, the lionfish in bronze covered with patina. This is the version I was uh, telling you about. This is a stainless steel version. So as I told you earlier, I cast, I actually sculpted this piece in two different sizes. The first one was here, and the second one I sculpted this piece in, um, this is the two, the two species, the two fish. The one is pretty the full hand, the other one is probably about five or six inches. And I decided to, to uh, cast this piece in 18 karat gold. So it's not, uh, it's solid gold, a sapphire in the eyes, and I think it was a perfect piece for me to create in, a, in such a very uh, high hand metal. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, it's already gone, it's been <laughs> sold. This is an edition of three. So there is two other ones out. And I'm going to start sculpting. One is going to be in a rose gold, and the other one is going to be in white gold with different stone. So now you know a little bit about the creation of the piece. And now we're going to go back to the real problem, the lionfish. And we're going to talk about the solution. Is there any solution for stopping or at least controlling this, this, this terrific, uh, this catastrophic uh, uh, invasion? So the first solution, it's encourage predation among other fish named mainly grouper, snapper, and shark. So uh, just um, uh, the grouper. The grouper has a hard time to, uh, has, is a fish who live in the Bahamas, but because the lionfish is not from the Bahamas, it doesn't really understand 
it doesn't look at it as a, as a, as a frame. So if you take a grouper from um, Indo-Pacific Indo Island, he will recognize the lionfish as a prey and he, would, and he would eat the fish. So, but it's interesting because in 2012, the, a fisherman find, caught um, a grouper and when he bring on his boat, the grouper cough a lionfish. So, did, did, the lionfish, lion, did the grouper was fed by a diver with the lionfish or did he prey on the lionfish? This we, there is a lot of study, we don't really know. Um, some other study in 2008 find out that maybe the grouper was really uh, preying on lionfish, on red lionfish. There is another research study who find out there is, protect, there is protected area in the Bahamas where they protect the grouper. And they find out that if the grouper is protected, there is less lionfish in the world. So one of the great, so great way to uh, control the lionfish, not, not that, to protect them, and not it's not the fatal the, the 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 solution, but it's a way to control the lionfish to protect the grouper. So more grouper, less lionfish. So that's. So um, I'm sure th uh, the aquarium of Long Beach is doing a big uh, conservation for grouper. And this is uh, one reason I think we should protect the grouper. That's one solution for stopping the lionfish invasion. The shark. The shark. I actually noticed myself when I was diving with my friend that the shark eat lionfish in the Bahamas. But they don't, they don't prey on healthy lionfish. If they are spare fish by diver and you hand the, the lionfish to a, to a shark, it will eat it. If you kill them, you put it on the, on the sand, it will come and grab it. But there is no study, there is no movie, there is no video of actually a, a, a shark chasing and eating a healthy lionfish. So do you really teach a shark how to eat <laughs> and he's gonna wait until you feed him lionfish? Or is he gonna, at some point, recognize the lionfish as a, as a prey? I don't know. So there is also something that us as human we can do because this is a mistake that we create. So maybe there is a way that we can fix it. There is a lionfish tournament all over. There is lionfish tournament from um, the Bahamas all the way to Cayman Island. They organize. Uh, bunch of divers, I've been talking to a bunch of divers who go in the water all together and uh, do tournaments to see how many they can cut every day. I know it's not a good way to do conservation, but this fish just doesn't belong there. And there is another way is to heat the lionfish. The lionfish is actually very, very tasty. So if you <laughs> end up being traveling in the Bahamas or in any of those places where they have lionfish, you can actually ask the restaurant to serve the lionfish. And they, it's, really, it's great in sashimi, it's quite fried, it's quite uh, any, any way you can eat it, and it's very, very tasty. And if you are uh, a diver and you like sp uh, spare fishing, go ahead and kill as many as you can. <laughs> That's uh, pretty much the only way we're gonna be able to uh, not stop, but at least control this invasion. It's a, it's, 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 it's a major problem. I don't think people realize how bad it is, but it's, uh, it's economically and uh, for the, ecos the ecosystem is completely unbalanced because of all the fish they're eating. So this is all uh, lionfish tournament. Even in Florida, some people come up with a beautiful little gun that you can use and teach you how to spare fish, lionfish, without being uh, sting. So here it is. This is uh, the problem that I bring up to you today. I hope you enjoy it and um, kill some lionfish <laughs> and eat them. <laughs>
from the uh, Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, trained as an engineer, became a designer after she had two children and she wasn't able to travel all over the world the way she did as an engineer for, for Bechtel Parsons. And uh, as a child growing up, she had taken art classes at the Art Center and then she was, she's a professor there and she used her engineering and her design for sustainability. And um, then Tom Bowman spoke to us. And the theme came up that, uh, along with the, the theme for this course, Integrating Art and Science, somehow we have to do a better job of getting artists and scientists to work together. And I go to an awful lot of conferences, and there will be scientific conferences, and they might have a talk or two by an artist, or more recently, it's a communicator trying to teach scientists uh, in an hour, how to be better at communicating their science. So I want to talk to you about getting a bigger bang out of colliding art and science in some of the ways that we might do this. And I think the challenge is that we have to increase the frequency of collisions between artists and scientists, and we have to fundamentally change the character of those collisions. So they just can't collide with each other at a conference and then go off in, in, uh, on their own. And the difference really is between elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. I'm sure you all remember from your high school physics that in elastic collisions, total kinetic energy is conserved. Elastic collisions are really at the atomic and the subatomic level, although things like this illustration come pretty close to elastic collisions. And uh, billiard balls are another one that are pretty close. Inelastic collisions are collisions in which while momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is not. Some of the kinetic energy is transformed into vibrational energy in the form of heat. And an inelastic collision changes the character of the two colliding bodies. If you remember, momentum is mass times velocity, and kinetic energy is one half times mass velocity squared. And so in an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved, momentum is, but the two bodies are fundamentally altered and you have generate heat. And this is a good example of an inelastic collision. Those two cars won't be the same. It's like when Adina drives home and runs into somebody. Where did she go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> or did they run into? <laughs> All right. So the nature of collisions and it is critical. And my hypothesis is that the, the collisions between scientists, designers, artists, if you have them more frequent and different kinds of collisions, good things can happen and we, we get a bigger bang for, for those. But then to what end? Because the places that this, this has been done, the Art Science Laboratory outside of Paris, and there's one in, outside uh, in Cambridge near MIT, they focus on things like making a better commercial to sell beer on the, during the Super Bowl. I have no interest in selling beer on the Super Bowl, but maybe there are better things that could come out of collisions of art and science if we were more serious about it. And as I've said last week, and I say often, the greatest challenge that we have is a design challenge because we humans have fundamentally altered the earth. It, it, and we have this growing population we have more people living along the margins of our coast in harm's way with rise in sea level, more frequent storms. We have a warmer world. It's going to continue to get warmer, a higher sea level, more frequent and intense tropical storms, and more prolonged and severe floods and droughts. And in California, one of the biggest hazards is from increased wildfires. And we're witnessing one right now. They're going to increase in frequency and duration and extent. And we're going to have a world with less biodiversity. And this is just a symbol for our ecological footprint. 
we not only now have fundamentally altered much of the Earth, we're trampling all over it. And when we hear things about we're going to restore things, you, we can't go home. I think restoration is a term that should be reserved for old houses and old furniture. We need to be thinking not about restoring, but about creating the kind of a future that we want and that is consistent with Earth's processes as have been affected by human beings. So it's the same, wetlands are a great example. Instead of restoring wetlands where they occur, we should be thinking of creating wetlands as sea level is rising because they have to migrate landward and or vertically and right now they can't do either in most cases because their paths horizontally are blocked by infrastructure and vertically we've cut most of the sediment off so they can't build vertically. So what's the alternative? I think the alternative is to design the future that we want and I, I know that sounds very arrogant but we don't really have any other choice. It takes vision and we have the knowledge and the technology but I think we have to have a vision and art and design play a big role. And uh, when Lisa talked about stories helping us to explore alternative futures, art, and I think storytelling is an art. And just to make the point, last year, near the end of last year, the United Nations estimated that by 2030, just think, 17 years, the world will need at least 50% more food, 45% more energy, and 30% more water at a time when a changing environment is creating new limits on supply. Now assume that they're wrong by 50%. It is still a huge, huge problem, and more of the same is just not going to work, help us. This is a book that was written a number of years ago, Human, The Science Behind What Makes Us Unique. It's a work with reading, and he asked the question, what evolutionary advantage does art give to human beings? Because as far as we know, we are the only species that has ever used art. And he makes the argument that art allows us to consider hypothetical situations so we can develop plans in advance of dangers. Same thing that Lisa was talking about with storytelling. We can explore alternative pathways to the future and we can figure out what to do. Art and science, they're different modes of knowing. We talked a little bit about that last week. Art evokes emotions, storytelling evokes emotions. Science works to convince. And when scientists usually try to to create emotional hooks, they get accused by their fellow colleagues of, in the scientific community of not behaving properly uh, like science. Now, how many of you remember the myth of Sisyphus? Sisyphus, all right. It was an old guy like Bob who was <laughs> condemned to spend the rest of his life rolling a rock up a hill because the feeling was that there was no worse punishment than being condemned to a futile task for the rest of your life. And here comes Sisyphus, rolling the rock up the hill. Looks very much like a scientist, doesn't it? And some of us have spent 50 years working on the same problems, and, and we're still like this guy in this cartoon, rolling the rock up the hill. We almost get it to the top. I, I studied Chesapeake Bay for a long, long time. They're studying the same problems now as they did when I did my PhD dissertation in Chesapeake Bay back in 1966. The problems haven't changed and we have been unsuccessful. And I think to a large extent, we've got to reframe the issues. So here's an artist. Most of the, the, the uh, collisions between artists and, whoops, most of the collisions between artists and scientists are like this one. Here's the artist. Here's the scientist. <laughs> They're at a meeting. They collide in the hallway. That's an elastic collision. If we could change that to a more inelastic kind of a collision, 
so that we could have artists and scientists come together in a different kind of collision, maybe. <laughs> maybe then if we did that, here comes old Bob rolling the rock up the hill. <laughs> and I think this time, and now you have to remember, Bob's a professor at the Art Center <coughs> College of Design, so he interacts with these artists all the time. Maybe, just maybe, if we did that, we could do something quite different. It's at least worth a try. And using the vehicles, instead of getting, making a better beer commercial or a better kind of a toothpaste holder, maybe we ought to be thinking about some of these bigger problems. Then you have to have a place, though, to show this to the general public, because we have to change the attitudes and behaviors of millions and millions of people. And one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next few years is creating what we call Pacific Visions, where it's an immersive theater, the most immersive experience anywhere for the public, anywhere in the world, using the kinds of simulations that now you can only have in the military, where you can explore alternative pathways to the future. And you don't preach, you let people discover. So you put them on a platform in the future, and they can look back and they can say, what did they do back in the year 2013 or 2014? And we're betting our future on this. We met with somebody today, and Emily was there. And people come to an aquarium, they wonder sometimes why we use technology. And I said to the person, it isn't because we care less about the animals. It's because we care more about the animals. And unless we can tell the big stories, the only place you're going to have some of these animals in 25 years will be in aquariums. Our, our animals are tools, ambassadors for those that live in the wild, because the real challenge is to figure out how to keep the ones alive and well and healthy in the wild. And that's why we use technology. And when we get all done, our, our aquarium is going to look like this. And it should look like this in 2017. They're probably going to roll me up here in a, stro in a wheelchair or something. But it's going to be quite a magnificent, magnificent aquarium. And I think we can design a new planet right here on Earth. All right. Questions or comments about for Lisa, for Victor, for me, or for anything on the topic that we're trying to look at of integrating science and art? And I should say that with, when, with, I mentioned that the Bob teaches at the Art Center College of Design. And this summer, we're going to have an entire class. How long is the summer session, Bob? Almost three months. So OK. We, we're having a class out of Design Matters. And we get all of the students, two professors, and then there's an intern, a uh, scholar in residence who's a marine biologist, and their challenge is to take everything that we do on ocean exploration and see if they can design a campaign that would make the public care about why we need to explore the ocean. Anybody have questions or comments? 